Good afternoon. I am Judy Eckberg, Chair of the Social Science Committee. Our program committees have scheduled 30 programs in this season of our enrichment series as part of our mission to strengthen our community through learning, giving, and sharing our landmark building. Gerald Savage, our presenter today, his formal name, native name, is Ho Chunk Ska Ga, or White Winnebago, and is a tribal elder with the Ho Chunk Nation. He will discuss the reintroduction of his family into Illinois, tribal customs and ways, and the history of the tribe. Gerald's grandparents were Chief Walks with the Wind and Princess Stands on a Cloud, who were very influential in teaching Gerald the native customs and ways. He carries on his grandfather's tradition of teaching people about the Ho-Chunk Nation. Welcome, Ho-Chunk Skaga, to our stage. Ho-Ho, Hechakaru, Nina Hina Kagari, Hapije Rajaska, Ho-Chunk Skaga, Hengaeira, Hanichari Haipin. Did anybody understand what I just said? Well, this would have been the language that was spoken in this area about 500 years ago. This was a traditional homeland for the Ho-Chunk people. We, uh, we ranged all the way from what they call Red Banks, which is what we call Green Bay, Wisconsin, all the way into Minnesota, down through Iowa, down to St. Louis, back up to Chicago, back up to Green Bay. That was our traditional Ho-Chunk uh, territory. We, have re we ranged quite a, quite a bit of area. If you look at what I got on today, I have a traditional chieftain's fur turban, and uh, I have some eagle feathers on the back of this. Uh, I am a member of the Bear Clan. I have a bear claw necklace on. This is an actual bear claw necklace. I have a bone breastplate, a bone choker on. I have a buckskin shirt. These are all traditional things. And then the beads would be trade beads. Trade beads that were traded with mostly the French. The French were the first people to come and meet my people. Like I say, at Red Banks, Nicolette met our people and he embedded the tribe with some Jesuit priests. The Jesuit priest, they recorded everything that was happening within our tribe. They noted that after our tribe got so big, we would have ourselves and send the other people to the west or to the south. So it was documented by the Jesuit priest that the Sauk tribe was created out of the Ho-Chunk and the Fox tribe was created out of the Ho-Chunk. If you listen to the white historians talk about uh, our language, they call my language a Siouan language. And I think they've got it backwards because the way we halved ourselves off, we've probably done for centuries. I talked with an archaeologist in Wisconsin, and he's dating the Ho-Chunk people back to 12,000 B.C. We were the original mound builders. We did uh, effigy mounds. So if you get to Wisconsin, you'll see a lot of effigy mounds. So the uh, traditional highways that you guys may think about as these cement things on the ground, well, the rivers were the traditional highways for the Ho-Chunk people. So they were like super highways. So they would have a lot of settlements along there. We, uh, we, we go ahead and uh, we do a lot of different things. Like I say, this is a, an oral history. A lot of my history is passed down from my grandparents. And they taught me a lot of things about the history of our tribe and our, our people. There's a picture of me here. It's, uh, Self-gravitating, I guess. Uh, the, here's our symbol for our, uh, the Ho-Chunk Nation. We call it the Ho-Chunk Nation. My name is Ho-Chunk Skaga, which means White Winnebago. I was named in 1963. We changed the name of the tribe to Ho-Chunk, back to Ho-Chunk, in 1964. The reason we changed that, the name Winnebago means, it's an Algonquin term, the Algonquin brought Nicolette over to meet us at Red Banks, and there must have been an algae bloom going on in uh, Green Bay 
because the term Winnebago means people of the stinky water. <laughs> And we're not the people of the stinky water. We're people of the, the big voice or people of the sacred voice. And like I say, we, we halved ourselves off after we got so big. We realized that the tribe, the area can only sustain so many people. Uh, I think the white people still haven't realized that yet. So, <laughs> My grandfather was chief walks with the wind. He was, uh, like I say, very influential in teaching me the different things. Uh, you'll see some history that we'll be talking about. Uh, I was kind of his sidekick, and I'll talk about his passing and all of that. And he passed a lot of information down, which, when you're young, you didn't you didn't care to hear it, but you, you hear it so many times, you, it kind of gets embedded in you. Here's my grandmother when she was younger. So. They were both from uh, Wisconsin Rapids. My grandfather was originally from the reservation in Nebraska, but they moved back to Wisconsin Rapids. They didn't know each other at the time. So until they, uh, until they got rounded up, this is my grandmother's family. I don't have a picture of my grandfather's family, but uh, they got rounded up by the state of Wisconsin and sent to a residential school. My, uh, my grandmother's father, Fred Mallory, the way he got uh, kind of caught up in this, uh, he had to go to work in the cranberry marshes. And he was working in the cranberry marshes and he was talking with some of his, uh, his fellow workers there and they heard that he had a family deep in the woods. And uh, Fred had to pick up a job because uh, the kids, they all wanted new Nike tennis shoes. So... Or Nike moccasins. <laughs> so they found out he had kids and the, the state rounded up all the kids and sent them to the uh, residential school. The same with my grandfather's family. They were sent to the mission school in Nellsville, Wisconsin. And that's where my grandparents first met. Here's a picture of the, uh, them out in front of the school. If you notice, uh, I don't see a lot of real young kids here, but if you imagine being taken from your home as a young child and being taught a different way, you notice all the boys have, they're dressed a certain way, they have haircuts, they had their hair cut off. The girls don't have uh, hair past their shoulders, so, and they were not allowed to speak the Ho-Chunk language. So that's where uh, the reality of that happened as they went through all of that. Well, after they got out of the residential school, this is a stock photo because I'm too cheap to find a, a real one. I'm not going to pay for one. <laughs> My grandparents got on with a Wild West show that toured the United States. They were in a Native American part of the Wild West show. So they were touring the United States and they met a very charismatic man uh, while they were on, and on tour. And... Uh, this very charismatic man asked my grandfather if he would be interested in moving back to Illinois. And, you know, that very charismatic man said it had been 100, over 100 years since there had been Native Americans in the Illinois Valley. And my grandfather, you know, he, he didn't agree right away. He wanted to see the property. So this was my grandfather's family at the time. And a little junior right here. I talk about him. Because Jun I say Junior died of racism. He was dark-skinned, and while my grandparents were on their way back from one of the Wild West shows, Junior got sick. Uh, he ended up having an appendicitis attack, and they wouldn't take him in the hospital because they knew my grandparents couldn't pay. So the uh, woman that was watching him, she called my grandparents, you know, when he got sick, they came flying home and they learned that uh, Junior wouldn't be able to go to the hospital. My grandmother, being from the residential school, knew that uh, she had some religious ties with one of the local churches and the church actually said that they would pay for Junior's hospital bill. And they took him back to the hospital, but it was too late. He died of sepsis. So, in a way, I was the the child to replace Junior. So that charismatic man moved my grandfather into Starve Rock, Illinois. This is a picture of the old Starve Rock. There's up in the top center there is the, Star, the old Starve Rock Hotel. 
It's currently tore down. And then the, all of this was parking lot concession stands. And, it's, uh, and up, up here is the uh, Star of Rock Lodge while it was under construction. My uh, grandfather moved into the woods, would have been back over here. So he ended up, uh, like say, that very charismatic man. His name was uh, Governor Henry Horner. And he uh, let my grandfather move into Star of Rock. And my grandfather became friends with the manager of the Star of Rock Lodge, and he would do weekend shows for the general public. Uh, he would just lay a blanket out, and that's how he made some of his extra money. He was also the doorman at the hotel. So the, the governor got him that job. So it worked, uh, it worked out as a good thing, but my grandfather in his later years, he did programs here in Chicago. I talked to some of the guys that are my age who've seen him do his program at their schools. So here's a picture of a postcard that my grandfather, uh, after Junior, the one on the left is my Uncle Hena, my grandfather, my grandmother, and then that's my mom on the right-hand side there. So uh, they had quite the, quite the history. My grandfather would put a teepee up by his uh, archery stand in Star Rock, and people would stop by and take pictures. So I remember he was very enterprising, and he would charge a nominal fee for a picture. So <laughs> we're going to skip ahead in time a little bit. The picture on the left is uh, Chief White Eagle. He was the one that actually named me. My grandfather is the one that's holding me on the right. And there's a picture on the right hand side of my mother, my father, my uncle, and then uh, myself with my grandfather. This was at my naming ceremony. It took place in 1963 in Star of Rock. The name, uh, you've heard my, my name is White Winnebago. And the way it was told, Chief White Eagle was looking for a sign from Mauna, the creator, to find out what, what he should name me. And he's looking around, and you have to think about this. This is a late 50s, early 60s, racism was fairly rampant. And he's looking at the, everybody there. Everybody there is real light-skinned. And he came up with the name White Winnebago. My uncle, he's got a little different version of the story. He goes, uh, I was speaking with uh, Chief White Eagle. That's my uncle in the picture there. Uh, he goes, I got a little different story that... Uh, Chief White Eagle told me, Chief White Eagle was a retired uh, school superintendent who decided he was going to go tour the United States. And he was telling him he was looking for uh, a new motor home at the time. And lo and behold, at the time of my naming, what comes around the corner was a brand new white Winnebago. <laughs> that was my uncle's version of the story. Humor is very big with the native community, so... <laughs> This is a picture of the crowd at my naming ceremony. It was said there was over 40,000 people that came to the native naming ceremony and people parked four and five miles out of Starved Rock and walked in. So it was a very big event. It was well publicized. My uncle was a commercial artist with uh, foot cone and belding in Chicago. And he knew all the right people to talk to. They said there was over 30 different tribes represented. If you look in the picture in the center there, there's all the chiefs sitting around, one of the drums there. They said there was uh, a lot of the tribes were well represented. So it was a big, a big event back then. We're going to jump into the future here again. And this was just uh, three years ago. We did a naming ceremony for my niece. This was the crowd. It was standing room only at the Star Rock Lodge. And uh, one of my, my sister, her eldest daughter, didn't have a name yet. And she goes, I really want to have a name for my eldest daughter. And uh, she told that to me and my brother. And I go, well, the land... The property, the tribal property at Star Rock is kind of in decay. We really can't have it there. So the lodge had uh, asked me to do a program. We did an an usually did an annual program. And I go, well, let's just do it at the annual program. And we had a standing room only crowd there because behind here was more standing. And uh, all along the back there, there's my niece 
You notice the buckskin uh, dress she has on. That was my mother's buckskin dress. Her mother had passed away from COVID in the meantime. So she didn't, she wasn't able to, that's the reason why me and my brother went ahead with this. It was one of her last wishes to have this done. Uh, Cleland Goodbear is the elder we got a hold of to come down and name my niece. He only got to meet her for a half hour. And Mauna gave her a name. He gave her the name of Wawapiwinga, which translates into good thinker. She's a nighttime troubleshooting analyst for Intel Corporation. So the name was very fitting. It's, uh, it was unbelievable. I, because I provided him all the family names, thinking that he would reuse one of them. He said, no, the Creator gave him that name, which I think actually fits her better. So, this is more, more of the uh, ceremony. We had a drum, we had myself and another Bear Clan chief were there for the ceremony. Are there any veterans in the group? Any of the, we, we want to thank you for your service. This is one of the things that we always do at our Native American ceremonies. You see on this first picture here, my friend, uh, he's got the uh, Eagle Staff. He was in the Marine Corps. He, uh, he carries his staff with them very proudly. We honor our, our veterans at every ceremony that we do. That's one of the first things that we do. The last time there was a naming ceremony at the Star Rock Lodge was in the 50s, early 50s. My aunt, she was named. And if you look at the pictures there, there's only one guy that's not a chief. And he was the manager of the lodge at the time. My grandmother made him a, a bonnet to wear. He didn't get to keep it. So, <laughs> But all the rest were uh, native chiefs that were invited to the naming ceremony. It was a big deal at the time for the lodge. Uh, we were welcome there. We were part of the family of the lodge for quite a few years because we would have nightly Saturday night programs there and we would dance, do ceremonial dances there. My grandfather was a Boy Scout leader also and he had his Boy Scout troop and it was kind of humorous with the way my uncle would tell it. He goes, we would be all in a line, all the Boy Scouts and he, he would say that we're going to do a, a certain sort of dance and he wanted one of his boys to step forward and volunteer. Well, all the other Boy Scouts stepped back except for my uncle. <laughs> he goes, oh, looks like we have a volunteer. <laughs> Here's one that I, you know, this resonates more with the children because I talk about, my uh, ethnicity is not a costume. It's, uh, this is regalia that I have on. So it's, uh, I always tell them that right around Halloween time, do not dress as an, a Native American. It's insulting to the Native people. Here's a picture of my cousins. He's got an eagle feather bonnet. He's a fancy dancer. And then my cousin, she's a regular dancer. And then a picture of me in my younger days when I was a dancer. Uh, maybe again someday, I don't know. <laughs> Back uh, one of the programs that we had, we'll talk about it. We'll go back to 1985. My grandfather had passed away. And the Ho-Chunk people are a matriarchal society. And being a matriarchal society, after my grandfather passed away, Chief Walks with the Wind, my grandmother asked me at the, uh, at the funeral if I wanted his bonnet. And... At 24 years old, uh, I knew I had a lot of life to live yet. But I had a little bit of wisdom at the time, too. And I told her, I go, no, that's his bonnet. He gets buried with his bonnet. And I didn't realize how wise that statement was at the time. So that started the wheels in motion. So, and I just received my bonnet back at about six years ago. That's why I wanted to show you what the traditional woodland would wear. And then, like I say, this is what uh, the chiefs would wear now. So we wear our eagle feather bonnets. And this is uh, more traditional. I was given this six years ago by my uncle. It had, uh, my grandmother had this made 
and it sat in uh, storage for quite a few years. The uh, elderly Ho-Chunk man that made it actually moved to Europe and in his later days he was going through some of his stuff and seeing the bonnet because my grandmother told him don't give the bonnet to him until he you think it's time. Well, he got a hold of my uncle, gave my uncle the bonnet, and he gave it to me at a ceremony at Starve Rock. So from that day forward, now I'm known as Chief White Winnebago. So that's uh, the bonnet uh, at the time. So that's how that came to be. Like say, being a matriarchal society, I am the eldest boy of the eldest daughter. That's how it works with the matriarchal society. Native, Native American uh, rites of uh, passage, manhood rites of passage. Here we've got two different pictures, and I'll describe mine. This is the first one's a Cherokee, where they take the kids in the kid in the woods for uh, a night. He's blindfolded and set where he doesn't know where he's at. So that's his manhood right. The uh, Sioux do a little different thing where they put the, the deer horn, they pierce their skin with the deer horn and they hang from the, uh, the cottonwood tree. And they do that for, until they have a vision. So in my tribe though, our manhood right was you're uh, 13 years old, you go into the woods for a week with what you can carry. So, and this kind of resonates to my, uh, my veteran people that are here. Uh, you remember your first night in boot camp? There was probably a little crying going on at the time. Well, it's the same way when you do your manhood right. You're 13 years old, you're in the woods, mom and dad are not coming to save you. You're in the woods by yourself. You do a lot of growing up that first night. You do a little crying too, but you, you do a lot of growing up. I uh, refer to this one here because at 13 years old, you're not a great planner. At 13 years old, I had two cans of Denny Moore. <laughs> yeah, that Denny Moore beef stew to a 13 year old is like gold. <laughs> well, we get by about three days and I forgot water. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I need to go get water. Where I did my manhood right was this big open piece of land uh, where there was a lot of trees, there was a couple ponds, and there was a swamp. I knew where the swamp was. I went down to the swamp. I go, this swamp has to be sourced from somewhere. So I went looking around. I found the source, the spring. I found the spring, and I got thinking I did this thing backwards. I should have got a water vessel first. <laughs> so at the swamp, there was all kinds of horse flies. I don't know if you guys are familiar with horse flies, but um, I'm down there and there's all kinds of horse flies buzzing my head. I look like a crazy person running with my hands like this, and it was just crazy. I, uh, I get down to the railroad tracks that were a couple miles away. I look in there and I find this milk jug. Luckily, my picture wasn't on the side. <laughs> so I found my water vessel. I was living pretty good after that. The only other casualty that week was there was a tame duck who became, uh, became one of my meals. So, <laughs> Water is very sacred amongst the Native American community. You're going to hear a lot, of the, a lot of the talk, especially it's ongoing up where the uh, bridge goes across the, the lakes up north. Uh, they're trying to keep Line 5 from going across the lakes anymore because they don't want to have a leak. It would contaminate all the lake's water with the oil that was spilled. They're trying to get them to reroute the, uh, the pipelines. Currently right now in northern Wisconsin, there's an ongoing thing to get the pipeline rerouted around their, around their reservation property. Currently right now, it's 10 years past due that they'd never renegotiated the pipeline. And the tribe does not want the pipeline on their property. So they have, uh, uh, the court system is in their back pocket. The Supreme Court actually sides with uh, the United States more often than they're supposed to because some of the treaties we talk about 
They are supposed to take care of the Native American people. This happened just last year where the Supreme Court denied water rights to the Navajo. And that's it, one of the treaty rights that they're supposed to have. But they cited that said, no, you just, got, uh, you just got electricity and that's enough for you. So uh, this is another slide I used for the young kids. How long does it take for this to biodegrade? A thousand years. I always ask them, how do you think it tastes? Don't taste too good either. So it's one of the things that we need to be conscious of to recycle. Uh, if you look in my truck during the summer, I never throw these into a garbage can. I, I crimple, crinkle them up and put them in my truck. So they're always on the floor and I got a recycle bin that I, I use to recycle all my plastics. So we want to try to make sure we recycle as much as we can. I have to get my environmental thing in. It's part of my program every time. And it's something that we should all be conscious of. Native Americans, we were one of the first uh, progressive farmers where we planted corn, what you guys would call maize. We would plant beans next to it, which would put the nitrogen back in the soil. And then we would plant squash to keep the weeds down. I asked my grandfather one time, how big were the cornfields at the time? You know, because we were studying this back in school at the time. And my grandfather goes, uh, what I was told by my grandfather was our cornfields were so big that it was, as, it was as big as a person could see three times. That's how big the cornfields were. So all three of these things can be dried and stored for winter food. So they, they had different places that they would move to during the different seasons for, to, keep the, uh, to keep the food replenished. We were fishermen. You see our fish baskets. We were uh, proficient fishermen, even into the Great Lakes. Uh, how many of you remember the smelt runs? And we don't hardly see them anymore. We've, we've uh, created a, a nature that uh, is slowly disappearing. There used to be a woodland buffalo that would roam this area. And we've, uh, we've hunted them to extinction. The uh, woodland buffalo, you don't see uh, river otters hardly at all anymore. Uh, even in these small tributaries, there should be a river otter or three running around. So we've done a lot of damage to our uh, environment. Uh-oh. Uh, this is, uh, we were hunters. Like I say, you can tell by my buckskin. I'm a, a proficient uh, hunter. We'd use the bow and arrow to hunt uh, the deer. And we have common names. I was telling uh, my lunch mates, we have common names, common Ho-Chunk names. I am a Kunu, firstborn boy. Secondborn boy is a Haina. Thirdborn boy is a Haga. Fourthborn is a Nagi. Fifthborn is a Nagizunu. And the same with the women, it goes down the line that way. Firstborn woman's Hinu. Second, Weha. Third, Haksiga. Fourth, Haneke. And uh, Haksiga Zunu for the women. Back then, they didn't have TVs, so the families were pretty large. So. <laughs> If you guys recognize what, uh, what do you guys, what, anybody, what do you call this? Peace Who said peace pipe? Even my own people get that wrong. <laughs> this, is, this is a prayer pipe. And it got the name peace pipe because when the white man first met the Native Americans, we sat down and we prayed for peace amongst each other. And that's how it got that name. And we've lost our culture along the way. But if you notice, the pipe here has a red stone on it. This is called pipe stone, and it can be molded into anything that you want. Um, I had a vision a long time ago to, probably about 10 years ago, to go to Pipestone, Minnesota, because it was in my dream that I went up there. And I've got a sumac stem on here. This is the Starve Rock ceremonial pipe. I went, uh, went up to uh, Pipestone, and I kind of wanted to find out more about this pipe. 
And uh, the man at the uh, museum looked at it, and on the bottom there, there's a name. All of the pipes usually have uh, who created them. He goes, that man died in the 50s. And he goes, ah, I'm glad to see that this still lives. So a lot of the pipes, they don't get to live uh, long lives like that. It, uh, so I went to the National Pipe Museum. And uh, I met this gentleman in the parking lot. I'm seeing this character. I'm going to call him a character walking out of the National Pipe Museum, and he has a white fur jacket on. And I used to trap when I was younger, and I can pretty much identify most furs. But he's got a white fur jacket on, and I go, hey, sir, sir, tell me about your jacket. I'm interested in your jacket. And he goes, uh, oh, this is goat. My goat died last year, and this is how I pay homage to him. And uh, I made a nice jacket out of him. And I thought it was a little odd, <laughs> like some of you probably thought. <laughs> uh, and I get talking with the guy some more, and uh, he's telling me about, uh, about uh, different things. And he asked me, he goes, uh, did you bring your uh, hand drum? And uh, no, how do you know I got a hand drum? He goes, I was told uh, you were coming. And I'm supposed to teach you some songs that help heal. So it was kind of an unusual pairing at the time. And I'll, I'll do it in a little bit here. But uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was meant to be that I met this, this man. He was telling me, he goes, I was at the, the Sundance and they were looking for a new medicine man. He goes, it's not like we were in line for, to be a medicine man. He goes, um, I'm there, I've been, at the, I've been at the sun dances every year. And he goes, I know the songs, I know the, the way we're supposed to do things. And they asked me to be the new medicine man. And he goes, I'm singing at sun dance and I'm singing my song. And I notice this woman dancing around, dancing around. He goes, by the time I'm done with my song, she's standing next to me. And she goes, oh, your song was so beautiful. You sound like, the, you sound like my husband did. And he turns to her and he goes, well, he didn't know what he was doing either. <laughs> like I say, humor is real big with the natives, even, even the ones you don't know that well. So uh, it, was, uh, it was kind of an interesting meeting because my, my son got kind of mad at me because we spent four hours in the parking lot talking with this gentleman. <laughs> and he had all kinds of things to talk about, to talk to me about. So it was kind of an interesting meeting. But Pipestone, uh, if you get a chance to go to Pipestone uh, National Monument, it's up in Minnesota, and it's right on the uh, South Dakota border. So he was from, uh, the, the medicine man from one of the South Dakota tribes there. I think it was the Dakota tribe. So it was uh, interesting. You can mold the, uh, you can mold this uh, Pipestone in anything you want. While I went to Pipestone National Monument, <clears throat> I had my son with me, and we get there, and we had to have our tribal IDs. They have to put that on record. And we go in and we, uh, we register to go quarry some Pipestone. Only Native Americans are allowed to pipe, quarry Pipestone at Pipestone uh, National uh, Park. So we get in there, and uh, the manager of the place goes, I'll have the... Uh, my maintenance man go pump out the pit. And, uh, you know, I, I did a little reading on this ahead of time where I knew I needed to bring a pick, I needed to bring some wedges, I needed to bring some sledgehammers. And it was, uh, I didn't expect the water. <laughs> so uh, it kind of caught me off guard that we gotta, we're going to be in uh, water. And I well, okay, well, we, I brought my boots, you know. Well, my son didn't bring his boots, so... Uh, We, uh, we go ahead and we, uh, we, uh, we get together with the manager and he goes, well, uh, the head of security will take you out to the pit, the, the pit you're going to be quarrying. He goes, let me tell you what, don't give any pipe stone to anybody. And I go, okay, that's easy enough. You know, didn't look like there was a lot of people visited the place. So he goes, oh, by the way, you're the only person that's going to be quarrying today. 
Um, okay. Well, he goes, here comes my chief uh, security officer. He'll be here to take you out to your thing. Well, up comes this young man. He's got uh, a desert camel, bulletproof vest on. He's got a sidearm on him. He's got uh, an M16 over his uh, one shoulder. And uh, I talk to him. I go, is there something I should know? <laughs> He goes, well, I just got back from uh, the Middle East uh, last week, and I'm still pretty comfortable wearing my, my uh, fatigues. <laughs> he goes, oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't running up against something that uh, I didn't know I was walking into. So it was, it was very eye-opening. Wow, we're Corey in the Pipestone, and my son at the time was a home run hitter in baseball, and he thought he was pretty strong. And he grabs one of the sledgehammers right away, and he goes to work on the uh, on the wall of the the pit. Well, he done he hasn't done any research at all like I had done, and the pipe stone is below quartzite. Quartzite's one of the hardest stones out there. If you notice, some of the rail uh, railways have the purplish stone. That's quartzite, and that's uh, one of the strongest stones out there. So he grabs that sledgehammer and he hits the wall of that, uh, of that little uh, quarry that we're in. And it was like watching somebody hit a steel girder. <laughs> Gone. And uh, we get back to the room that night. He took two steps, fell into his bed, and he was out for the night. <laughs> he had uh, he'd done quite a bit of work that day. So it was... Uh, it was an interesting day. So we, we, had, uh, we had done that, like say it was about the fourth day I went and talked to the guy that I met that, uh, I met the medicine man at the uh, National Pipe Museum. The, uh, some of the oldest musical instruments that we have, the drum, Did you guys feel the resonance from the drum? There's healing power in the drum, which the medicine man was telling me. He goes, there's a lot of healing that happens from this. This is the heartbeat of Mother Earth. We channel that, and we say, they sing these sacred songs. He goes, one of my most frequent uh, things is delivering babies. He says he gets called out to these little shacks, where the woman's uh, pregnant and she thinks she's about due, he goes and visits and he says he sings this song. He sings this song and the next thing you know, I don't want to sing the song, I don't want to have any babies here. <laughs> he, sing, he gets the heartbeat going of the mother with the heartbeat, it mimics the drum and it does the baby also and it encourages that baby to be born. He said that's one of the most common things that he does. And then he gets calls to other ones for pancreatitis cancer. He gets calls for diabetes. He gets all kinds of different calls. And he tries to heal them with the old songs and the drum. So he talks about the healing power that's in the drum. It's one of the oldest instruments that we have. Like I say, we're going to be talking a lot of different things. If you look on the the picture here, you'll notice this rattle. How many squares are in the middle here? I know somebody knows. I know there's a couple of uh, teachers here. There's 13. How many moons do we have each year? 13 moons. How many days, minimum days, do we have in a month? 28 days. There's 28 things on this turtle shell. They call this place that we walk on Turtle Island. There's a lot, of, a lot of symbolism in this rattle. So we use this during some of our ceremonies. We don't waste anything on, if you notice this rattle here, there's a gourd. And some of the stones that we found are inside. It had to be rebuilt. One of the programs I did one of the special needs kids grabbed it and broke it. So it was rebuilt. Uh, got the gourd from one of the tribal properties. 
And then you notice the last one. Don't expect anything good. I'm not that good. So that's my pre-warning for you. I did this at the college the other day, and I got this big round of applause. And I go, I can tell none of you are music majors. <laughs> Say I'm not, I'm not in tune today, so that's uh, about the best you're going to get out of me today. Uh, now with the flute, uh, <laughs> the native flute in my tribe, only the men are allowed to play the wooden native flute. Uh, it's made for uh, men to use for courting, and at any age. So, uh, guys, you might want to borrow my flute afterwards. <laughs> Some of the young ladies might like that. So, uh, we've done this uh, throughout the ages. Where uh, it's part of our tribal culture that we do that. I heard some people talk uh, about going to casinos early. Earlier, we have a uh, casino on Black River Falls. If you notice the monument on the right, it's the Red Arrow Division. It pays uh, honor to the World War One veterans in Wisconsin. That's where our tribal headquarters is. You'll see the row of flags there. They honor the different parts of the military. We have the names of all of the people who served in World War I that were from Wisconsin. Only two of those died in action of the 26th. So bear in mind that these people served when they weren't even uh, considered citizens of this country. Uh, it reminds me of a story I was telling earlier. I had this, uh, I was doing a program down in Manuka, Illinois, and they told me, the librarian told me, watch out, Milo's going to be here today. And I'm thinking, Milo is, uh, what is he, an argumentative old historian? And uh, she goes, no, he's an 11 year old prodigy. He's in the library four and five days a week. He can't get enough to read. And he comes to every single one of our programs and he asks the most pertinent questions. And I go, well, I'll be interested in seeing this young man. And he's there and I'm doing my program and right away his hand goes up and I go, young man, you gotta wait. You gotta wait, we'll do questions at the end. And you know, he's there and he's, there's a million things going through his mind and he wants, he wants answers, so. And we get to this point, and uh, he couldn't stand it any longer. He jumped up and he goes, that's unfair, you guys were citizens long before we were here. <laughs> and I go, young man, we need you to run for Congress. <laughs> Coming up real soon, we're having our 100th year anniversary of becoming citizens of this country. So on June 2nd, 1924, uh, was the day that we were granted citizenship. Still to this day, a lot of my native relatives are not allowed to vote because they have post office boxes because they live so, so rural on the reservations. So they're not allowed to vote. So that's got to change. So patriotism at a cost. We talk about uh, our native peoples. Our soldiers uh, suffered higher than usual casualty rates because of the thought that the Native Americans, you know, we'd been washed out of our culture for so long, but they still thought it was inbred in everybody. So, well, they had, they had uh, higher casualty rates than the white soldiers. We were the original code talkers, the Native Americans. You know, it's kind of romanticized that the Navajo were the code talkers. No, there was quite a few tribes that were actual code talkers. If you, if you, look, about, you look at it, the Germans could never break the Native American language because there were so many different languages that were spoken. And, uh, you know, you had to have one on each end. So that was a very, very important thing that we did for our, our, citizen, or for our country. You look at this uh, statement here, American Indians have proudly worn our nation's uniform in every one of our conflicts. This goes all the way back 
Uh, I talk about it in another program where if you love your freedom, you better thank Chief Pontiac. He taught uh, the revolutionaries how to fight the British. So we've had uh, the highest percentage per capita of people who serve in the service. So, because we're such a small group anymore. <clears throat> As Ho-Chunk people, we have our own hero here. Mitchell Red Cloud is a Medal of Honor winner. He served in uh, Korea. He, uh, he was uh, mortally wounded. And he told his, uh, the people in, that he served with, tie him to a tree, leave him a machine gun and some hand grenades, and he held off the oncoming Chinese battalion long enough for his battalion to regroup and face that, face that onslaught. And he won the Medal of Honor for that. I remember when I was young, I couldn't take time off work, but they, they have a uh, troop ship name for him out in the Pacific. Uh, I would have liked to have gone to that. My uncle and my grandparents all went. It was a big deal for the tribe. Uh, Mitchell Red Cloud was a Marine, and then he re-enlisted in the Army. So he had, uh, he had some military, back, military training to do that. He knew, he knew how to, be, uh, to take care of his brothers. So we, uh, we, we have yearly ceremonies for him. So and still to this day. Native American... Indian Religious Freedom Act in 1978. Growing up, I grew up at Star Rock, Illinois. We would have the Native Americans from Chicago come down and we would have Native American church down at our property at Star Rock. And my mother would tell me, if anybody asks what what's going on, just tell them we're having a meeting. Well, still yet today, that's code in our Native community for Native American church. We're going to have a meeting Saturday night. I already know what that means. We're going to have a Native American church. So, we, uh, it was legalized in 1978, but the FBI didn't recognize that. They raided a lot of Native American church because of the peyote use. In 1994, it had to be revisited and reauthorized that they could use peyote in that. And there's different sorts of... Uh, religion that the natives can do also. So if you look here, we have Native American church. There's two different sects of that. Some use peyote, some don't. And then we have the sweat lodge. So I'm more of the sweat lodge guy. You can't tell, but I haven't been in the sweat lodge long enough. <laughs> so we have religious freedom, just like you white people have religious freedom. Uh, we can go to any one of our churches, just like you guys can go to any of your churches. You can handle the snakes or drink the Kool-Aid. <laughs> I was warned not to say that in southern Illinois. <laughs> Here's an article that was taken out of one of the collegiate magazines. It talks about in 1814, there was a $50 bounty put on Native American scalps. And the only criteria that uh, was put on this was they, if they entered a, a, uh, a white establishment or a white settlement and they had murderous intent, you can get paid $50 for their scalp. Well, who's to say whether there was murderous intent or not? So it... Uh, it, it goes back uh, to one of the first, just before the first roundups in Illinois. The Illinois Territory went all the way up into Minnesota, the original Illinois Territory. So what we had for the Illinois Territory was volunteer militia. If you wanted to be in the Illinois militia, you were issued a musket, you were issued a shirt and a hat and you were given your meals. And uh, one of their first things in the 1820s was a roundup of Native Americans. Started in southern Illinois and moved its way north. And it was kind of a half, half, ha half hazard roundup at the time because put it in your mind yourself. You're a volunteer. You can leave any time you want. 
There's no, you didn't sign any paper saying you wanted to be there that long. So they would round up the natives and they would take, drive them to the north. And at night, and this is my grandfather was telling me, some of the natives would escape into the woods. Would you go into the woods after Native Americans at night when you were a volunteer? <laughs> Probably not. So a lot of, there's a lot of settlements that happen that way. And the people realized they had to be deep in the woods, not to be, not to be seen. Here's uh, the first treaty map. There was uh, 29 different treaties drawn up. And they go back into the uh, late 1700s because some of it's land cessation. A lot of this is land cessation where the, they got to live in these areas. And then later again, they redrew another one where... Well, we're going to redraw this one and we're going to take more land. And then in the 1830s, we've had enough. We're going to take all of it. So they went ahead in uh, 1832. There was a renewed effort to remove Native Americans. Today, the BIA has kind of set the, has the, uh, the mentality yet that was set a long time ago. The only good Indians are dead Indians from Teddy Roosevelt so, uh, spoke that. But uh, the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and that was done by the federal government. So they, uh, they went ahead and they drove everybody up and out of Illinois. A lot of them got relocated into Missouri and Iowa. A lot of them went to Oklahoma. Some went into uh, Minnesota. I had uh, lunch with uh, a young lady that was talking, talking about, uh, she was from a town up in Minnesota. We had, they took all of our people up there. And after the Dakota 38 debacle, uh, the, they uh, formed a secret society to rid the Ho-Chunk Reservation that was put in Mankato, Minnesota. So um, there's a book written by Kathy Coates. She kind of finishes the story that I start here. It, it's kind of neat reading because... I was reading the book and I go, you know, this is the end of the story of, of my story here. So it, it's really neat. Right now, uh, I'm going to finish with a Native American story. So oh, let me do this right because if there was an elder here, they would yell at me. time ago, long before the two-leggeds walked on this turtle island, the crow was the most beautiful bird in the world. He was as smart as he is yet today. He had all the colors of the rainbow, and he, could, he had a voice, a singing voice that was second to none. He was one of the most beautiful birds in the world. Well, the head crow gets together, and he calls for a council, because he had a meeting with Mauna. I'm going to meet with Mauna to find out what we need while they draw this council together. And you can imagine at any council that you get together, they ask, are there any concerns? And there's a lot of petty concerns. Oh, so-and-so keeps taking my stuff. So-and-so does this. So-and-so does that. And he goes, well, we can, we can deal with that here. And, but the elder crow, he stands up. At night, it is so dark out at night, strange things rub against me and my relatives at night. And in the morning, some of them are gone. He goes, it's so dark. So he goes, I'll, I'll relay this message to Mauna when I meet him. So the head crow meets with Mauna a couple weeks later. And uh, Mauna kind of knows what's going on. He's, he's, uh, he's very uh, empathetic about what's going on. And the head crow tells him, I've got an elder that says it's so dark at night. Strange things rub against him, and his relatives come up missing in the morning. And uh, he goes, come back in a hundred years, I'll have a solution for you. And back then, time flew by. So, Mauna went across the countryside, and he sprinkled some of these uh, seeds, and a hundred years goes by. And they meet, and uh, the head crow brings that up. He goes, 
what can I do? Uh, you know, what's, what's the solution to the problem? He goes, the solution to the problem is gather as much of the sacred wood as you can and take it up to the highest hill. He goes, well, how will I know what the sacred wood is? He goes, it's from the tree that snows in the summertime. And the head crow is still not really ga you know, gathering what he said. So the uh, Maona goes, it's from the tree that has the star in the knuckle. And uh, they kind of get it then. And he goes, gather as much of that sacred wood as you can and take it up to the top of the highest hill. But be forewarned. Whatever you do, do not touch the sacred fire. For there will be dire consequences. And this is the part that I always, I like to have the young kids ask them if they know what dire consequences are. And then I always tell them, depends who the crowd is. Well, it's when you don't listen to your parents. Or, or you don't listen to your, your teacher. So, no, there will be dire consequences if you step into the sacred fire. For you and your people. So, the head crow gets... Uh, gets all his crows together and they gather all of this sacred wood and they, they make a big pile. It takes about two months to gather every single piece of wood that was on the ground. And they have this huge bonfire. They go ahead and light it. So, you see the embers going up. Every time an ember would go up, a spirit would come down and take an ember and put it in the sky. And that's how the stars came into the sky at night. This happened for about four days. And at the end of the fourth day, here's the stars in the sky. At the end of the fourth day, uh, the spirits quit coming. And there was an ash field left. The fifth day, the head crow comes back and he looks at that ash field and he remembers what Mauna said. Don't touch the sacred fire. And he knows the sacred fire is probably still going. So fourth day, he, he backs away from it. Fifth day comes, he comes back and visits the ash field. And, you know, curiosity has really got the head crow, you know. So he, now I'm, I'm thinking it's still going. The sixth day comes back and looks at this ash field. And he's thinking about it, thinking about it. Well, the seventh day comes back. And he's got to know. So he puts his foot into the ash field. Sure enough, the fire's not out. It flares up. And it catches the crow on fire. And he dances around and catches his tail on fire. And he dances back around. By then, the fire's flared up again and it burns his throat. And uh, just then, a crack of lightning and thunder happen. Mauna shows up at the side. And he's not very happy. And he goes, I told you not to touch the sacred fire for there will be dire consequences for you and your people. See how you are now? You're black. You're burnt black. This is how you and your people will be now and forever. You hear your voice? The only thing that you can say now is, crow, crow. <laughs> and that's how the, how the crow became black. <laughs> and that's why the crows are black and how the stars are in the sky. <laughs> we'll uh, entertain questions now. So if uh, somebody has some questions, I know I covered a lot of different things in a short amount of time. So we, uh, we'll, we'll entertain questions here. Yes, I would like to know where I can get one of those drums. <laughs> they actually sell them at the, uh, the powwows. Some of the drum makers go to the powwows. And I will, I will get you a guy's name. So he's from Rockford. He makes them. So the, uh, it's, it's kind of a neat thing because he stretches. Because he'll ask you what kind of hide you want. I use deer hide on mine. But they have elk hide also. You showed a picture of raising the flag on the Japanese island of Iwo Jima. Wasn't one of those uh, Marines a yeah. Native American? Yeah, Ira Hayes. Yeah, he was a, he was a Marine that kind of got lost. Uh, I have a story. We did the uh, tribute to my grandfather. Uh, 
way back, probably 10 years ago, we did a tribute. And this man come up. And he was, uh, he had tears coming out of his eyes. He was a great big blonde haired muscle kind of guy. He was older though, you could tell. And he goes, uh, I come back from Vietnam and I didn't know who I was. He goes, I was lost. He goes, your grandfather took me in and showed me who I was. Your grandfather made me the man I am today. He goes, the service kind of made me lose my origin. So he goes, your grandfather taught me who I was. And, you know, he was crying then. And it actually brought a tear to my eye to hear his story. Because I remember growing up, we had so many people come through. And they would stay with us. So, yeah. Uh, we, 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 uh, Ira Hayes was from one of the tribes down in uh, the southwest. So I'm, I know our culture up here. I try to I know as much of it as I can. I'm still active with my tribe. I'm on our election committee for our tribe. So I try to, try to be uh, as traditional as I can. So. And many of you may know that uh, Johnny Cash sang the ballad of Ira Hayes on his album, Bitter Tears. Mm -hmm. So um, I was wondering if it's a matriarchal society, what kind of ways or decisions do the women make? They would make the decisions whether we would go to war with another tribe at the time uh, because they had so much to lose. They had their male partners to lose, their sons. Uh, you know, they, they had quite a few, and, but they were the ones that helped teach also. So it was a very important part of growing up. You know, they, my grandmother didn't teach me the ways of the women. Only my grandfather taught me the ways of the men. So I kind of wish I would know more because people in my tribe ask me about different things. And I go, I only know the way of the men. So that's what I was taught. And I know there's a couple of the women that were close to my grandmother that were taught the ways of the women. So, but uh, they don't talk about it, though. But they need to talk about it and pass it on. You were talking about the pipe stone and how hard it is and how difficult it is to quarry. I'm curious because you also said you can make it into anything, so I'm confused. So yeah. how do you make that? I mean, what do you mean <laughs> about that? When you first quarry the pipe stone, it's, it's fairly soft. You can sand it or chisel it into anything that you want. And then you would, uh, you would bake it or, or boil it and it turns hard. So uh, I learned this by doing it, that uh, yeah, I can pan fry it, basically, with water, and it'll turn real hard because I made little turtles. Uh, I made uh, some different small things that I could use with the, the small pieces of uh, pipe stone. And I gave them away. It's, it's kind of tradition that we would give, give those away because to buy them, you're not supposed to be able to sell any of that stuff. So. Uh, that was so interesting about what you're doing down in Starved Rock, and you mentioned some land. Now, is this a group that's kind of growing? Is it, uh, <laughs> what's going on? Around? Is it a community? Back in 19, my grandfather was moved into Starved Rock in 1935. And in 1964, 65, he was kicked out of Starved Rock. And we had to purchase some. Um, a gentleman from the area came forward and kind of gave my grandfather five acres back within Starve Rock. Well, in order to prevent any family infighting, we sold the property to the tribe. We sold the property to the tribe to, uh, to make sure there was peace within the family. So we went ahead and sold the property to the tribe. And so it's actually tribal property now. I take care of the tribe. I grew up there. My, my brothers and sisters, we all grew up there. My cousins, they kind of grew up there. It's, uh, it's complete tribal property now. We used to have powwows on the property. And someday we'll get it back to that thing, but it's going to take some time. Because like anything, if you, you witness in, a, in our actual government here, there's a lot of infighting. I don't know if anybody's seen that with our U.S. government. <laughs> but... It's the same way within our tribe. There's a lot of infighting because 
They want to keep everything in Wisconsin. Well, they own property here in Illinois, and they need to concentrate on getting that land put into trust so we don't have to pay taxes on it. So right now we fight our own people <laughs> because they want everything in Wisconsin or something like that. So it's a, it's a battle that I probably won't see the resolution of in my lifetime, but maybe my, uh, my son will. So it's a, an ongoing thing. And we don't advertise it as tribal property because Star of Rock gets almost three million visitors a year. And if we put a sign out there that said native, if it was Ho-Chunk tribal property, you know how most people would probably go to look at it thinking it's a tourist thing. So it just says, do not enter private property. <laughs> and I'm a beekeeper, so I got my bees guarding the property. So they're, not, they're usually pretty friendly, though. It depends on the day. <laughs> when I look at uh, American Indian nations that live in this area or have lived in this area, Potawatomi comes up a great deal. Are you, how do, how do the Ho-Chunks and Potawatomi relate to each other? Okay, I'll, I'll address that piece of history. <laughs> the Pot if you know anything about the Potawatomi tribe, their tribal headquarters are, is in uh, Michigan, and then where they were relocated down into Kansas. Well, they were pushed into Illinois by the Iroquois. The Iroquois were a very warlike tribe and pushed the Potawatomi into Illinois. The Potawatomi were taught how to fight by the Iroquois, and they chased out the Ojibwe, the Ho-Chunk, uh, they pushed the uh, Kaskaskia, the Weas, they pushed a lot of the tribes into different areas. So that's how the Potawatomi are known you know, by the native people as uh, they become the bullies, uh, but they were here too. So we have to recognize at some point in time that they were here too. It's a moving timeline on these different uh, territories. And I had that argument with, at the uh, State Museum because uh, they were showing Potawatomi only. And I go, your timeline is all wrong, especially the date that you have there. So it's, it's a moving timeline. So We'll take two questions and then we will adjourn to tea. There's a lot of uh, concern about cultural appropriation these days. And uh, a friend of mine does some dances uh, of international peace, of universal peace. And there's some controversy about whether that should be done, if they're native dances, if that should be done by non-native people. What is your take on that? I kind of addressed that at lunch today <laughs> uh, with the people I was sitting with because there are a lot of, I remember just last last month the, the girl from Northwestern University that runs the Native American Museum says I'm not Native American I go let me stop you right there because you are more Native American than some of my Native American relatives it's in the heart if we start uh, bashing anybody who tries to resemble any part of our culture we go backwards in society not forwards so that's that's my thought on it Since language is so much a part of culture, um, how much of your language are, is passed down and do you speak in your native language when you're at your meetings and you know, how, like, how, much are you able, how much are you able to retain of your language? That's a great question because we actually have our language teachers coming down to Chicago to presentate uh, I think in about two weeks at our Chicago Ho-Chunk office. Uh, when I was growing up at 10 years old, my grandparents made us sit at the picnic table and learn our language. At 10 years old, you know, you want to go run and play, not learn the language. But I still speak some of it. I can understand everything. Uh, they asked me to say prayers at the powwows. Uh, I still do a lot of that. I say prayers at a lot of our meetings. So it's, uh, it needs to be taught to all of our younger people. And uh, this is going to be my shameless thing to ask you guys to go to the casinos. Because this is how 
the money that's raised at the casinos helps put forth our cultural programs. It's not just a big money-making scheme, and it takes care of our elders, uh, takes care of our youth to teach them our cultural ways. So it, it's, uh, there's a big relationship, uh, and I have the biggest fight amongst my own people, and I try to tell them, do not gamble in our casino. <laughs> it does not look good, especially if you win. <laughs> And it, it falls on deaf ears. And, you know, they think that, they think I'm the old guy that's preaching to them. And no, I'm just telling you what reality is. So it's, it's important. Uh, so if you get a chance to stop by, you can go up uh, 39 in uh, Madison on the right-hand side. You can't miss it. <laughs> There's uh, one in Wisconsin Dells, one in Black River Falls, one in Nakusa. So, and soon one in... Uh, uh, Beloit, so.